How is free speech doing in America today, really? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. On this video series, Speaking Freely, we're talking from time to time with thought leaders and major players in the free speech drama unfolding in this country. Today, David Sanger, the national security correspondent for the New York Times, joins us in the studio. David Sanger, National Security Correspondent for the New York Times, thanks for being with us today to talk about free speech issues. Well, great to be back with you, Sandy. One of the free speech issues that is perennially on people's minds, a lot of people's minds, or should be on their minds, is the question of how freely the mainstream media, the national media, are able to function in the field of covering what our government is doing in terms of foreign policy and national security on the theory that an informed democracy, an informed public is essential to democracy. What is the state of that degree of awareness during the Trump administration? Well, oddly, we have not yet had any significant conflict with the Trump administration on national security issues. It, the moment will come. Uh, I've had a few experiences with stories about uh, very sensitive uh, national security operations, and we can go talk about that. But I think maybe the place to frame this, Sandy, is why is this such a particularly hard problem? And here it is. Sure. Everybody is in agreement that all aspects of American policy, what's done in the names of the people of the United States, have to be fully covered of by all media. Okay. When you hit national, when you hit foreign policy issues, most of that's out into the open. You can see the public policy making. Then there's a layer behind that of sort of secret diplomacy and so right. forth. And Which is not so secret to, anymore. Not usually so secret. And you know what happened with WikiLeaks is we essentially discovered that at least as of 2010, American diplomats were pretty much doing in private what they said they were doing in public. Right, right. Uh, it was a little embarrassing to some of them to hear yeah, the language maybe, but, right. but it was... The making of the sausage was a little ugly. Right, right. There were a lot of four-letter words. Small surprise. Right. right. We, we, we all understand that. That's what happens when you're trying to do really difficult stuff. The hard questions come when you are dealing with either covert operations, military operations, or new technologies that the U.S. government is trying to go cope with and would make the argument that we are helping our adversary. Uh, the, the New York Times is helping its adversaries, CNN, the Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, by publishing details of those operations. And then the question comes up, well, why do you publish this? And the right. answer is simple. Why aren't you more patriotic? Why aren't you more patriotic? The answer to this is simple. There is a higher form of patriotism out here, which is we have a long record going back many, many decades of the United States doing things under the cover of classification that the U.S. government has later come to regret. And we've regretted many times undercovering some of these issues. The Exhibit classic case is the Bay of Pigs. Bay of Pigs would be a great one <laughs> where President Kennedy called uh, Scotty Reston, then the bureau chief of the New York Times, after we had withheld some details of this and said, I wish you had published that story. Right, right. There were a few adjectives built in between there, right, because you would have kept me from the biggest mistake of my life. But to give you another one, had we imagine a scenario, didn't happen, wish it had, imagine a scenario in which we had had access to the intelligence reports that cast significant doubt that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction right. and had published those prior to the invasion of Iraq. Okay. A would have called into question a public 
uh, reason that the Bush administration sure. was giving us. B, might have saved the United States from what I think in the, you know, retrospect of 14 years of history, we now consider to be one of the greater strategic errors the United States Not has to made. mention saving a lot of lives on all sides. And saving a lot of lives along, along the way, American, Iraqi, and many others. Um, so that's so a freer, more open discussion of the options available to the government in the media might have prevented some tragedies. Well, we discussed the options, and in fact, my colleague Eric Schmidt published a fascinating story on July 4th, 2002, the year before the invasion, right. describing the invasion plan, okay? And we took a lot of heat for that story. We did publish a fair bit about the doubts uh, concerning the quality of the intelligence, the sort of unknown unknowns, to use Rumsfeld's great phrase. <laughs> um, but describing an absence of evidence is a much different thing than describing doubts That's within right. the government that, that Saddam could go do this. Now, we've had the reverse situation in an area that I cover a lot of, which is cyber, which is writing stories about America's first covert operations using cyber weapons. And you'd say, well, why would you go publish that? And the answer is simple. We are, as a nation, the most vulnerable country to cyber attack on the U.S. As we've, as proven we've learned every week, right? right? Whether it's Aetna or whether it's Equifax or whether it's the All Sony attack, it's major hacks, major hacks, right? We're because we're the most wired society, we're the most vulnerable society, and so the way that we choose to use cyber against other countries sets a set of parameters of how they're going to be used against us. And that's a subject the U.S. government has been completely unwilling to debate in public. Right. And so it's up to the media to introduce if that we debate. Didn't, if we didn't do it, nobody would. I'm at work right now on a book that is a, exactly on the subject of uh, how cyber warfare has actually changed, become the main way that countries compete with each other. And yet, when was the last time you heard a president of the United States sit down and give a speech describing the rules and reasons under which we would use cyber weapons. Oh, it's never happened. Never happens, and it's not likely to happen. Not for a long time. Right, so some of these leaks are very different these days from the old times. Um, shadow brokers, what's, what's, what's that about? So shadow brokers isn't a journalistic leak, interestingly enough. You, you've had a series of, of leaks, and I would say there have been three big piles, WikiLeaks, the Snowden revelations, right. and Shadow Brokers, which is the least known and most damaging of them, that have come from insiders. So WikiLeaks came from a private right. uh, in the Middle East who downloaded the State Department's cables, a lot of defense cables. Uh, Snowden was a NSA contractor who walked off with names and descriptions of big programs. and. Uh, shadow Brokers is, came from the inside of what's called the Tailored Access Operations Unit of the NSA. This is the sort of special forces of the NSA. Right. And they, that appears to be an insider. We don't know for sure. Either they were hacked into or an insider grabbed the stuff. And someone... And has not been caught. Has not been caught, as far as we know. And someone maybe the Russians under some theories, maybe disgruntled um, employees, have created what's essentially a, a hard to trace website that dumps not only the names of the programs, not only the names of the, the code names, but the code itself. So that countries that were targeted might actually see the weapons, the cyber weapons. So is there an there. argument against publishing that information? Well, you know, you could certainly make an argument against the details of the information, but this is an important distinction you, you strike upon. Our readers, uh, ordinary readers in their times, if I publish the source code of a cyber weapon, it would look like zero and one gibberish. Right. Them, okay? It's going to mean nothing. It is important frequently to report on what the U.S. is doing and how it's doing it. So if the U.S. is complaining that the Chinese are coming in and stealing our data, while we, meanwhile, are going inside Chinese companies, that's an important thing to know, Sure. right? 
at, you don't necessarily need to provide the source code about how we're getting inside the Chinese companies. You know, one of the issues that doesn't seem to come up, uh, and I think someone will be catching up with it eventually, is that even as we're discovering how much the Russians may have tried, may have succeeded in interfering with our presidential election last time around, how often have we tried and succeeded in interfering with other countries' elections? And, and it, we're not the only ones. The British and we're tried certainly in not the only ones. The British tried in 1940 with our election right. when they wanted to make sure that the United States got into the war on their right. side. Um, so yes, this has gone on for a long time. However, something different has happened now, which is that the merger of old information warfare techniques and very new cyber techniques and is social it? media has basically taken an old thing and supercharged it. It's, it's very different from the CIA having a few people in Italy who are trying to muck with their elections or with some, some of the old, almost quaint sounding now American yeah. interventions in other countries. Or even the is, Soviets in the Cold right. War, you know, they'd like pay off some reporters, maybe they didn't even know who they were being paid off by, to put some stories favorable to something or another into some farm newspaper in the middle of the country. And your ability to measure how many people read this, zero. Right, right. Okay. right. That's a very different thing than creating bots that can replicate stuff on Facebook to a very targeted audience. Sure. There's a nostalgia sometimes to look back at the Pentagon Papers case and think there was the great moment where the media stood up, the, the newspapers in particular, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and some others stood up to the Nixon administration, uh, were not uh, intimidated during the court cases to back off at all, and prevailed. Uh, lots of argument about how meaningful a precedent it turns out to have been, but prevailed at the Supreme Court in June of 1971. That's a long time ago now. It is. And uh, 46 years, to be precise, 46 and a half years even, since the Pentagon Papers case. What would happen today, do you think, if there were such, if today's Daniel Ellsberg, now in his mid-80s, if today's Daniel Ellsberg were to walk into the newsroom of the New York Times. First of all, he probably wouldn't walk into the newsroom of the New York Times. He'd use your Dropbox or something yeah. like that. Uh, with, with, a, with, with a USB, you know, in hand with the documents, that's right. That's right. Uh, we would not have here, had... Here, David. Right. We would not have had to go rent hotel rooms no. around Midtown Manhattan. No cardboard boxes, boxes having their own seats on airplanes <laughs> and that's things right. like that. Right. Uh, those days would be over. So. When I teach about the Pentagon Papers, as you've often done, and you've written more on this than, and, and more brilliantly than, than almost anyone I can think of, um, the first thing I do with students is I tell them, go back and read a few pages of the Pentagon Papers, right. okay? And then come back and tell me why the government tried to stop this. Because when you read the Pentagon Papers, fascinating as some of it is, it's history. And it was history at the moment it that it was released, then, right. right? It was a, hist a secret history of how the United States escalated, either knowingly or unknowingly, blundered into a bigger and bigger war, right. series of bad decisions, right. series In of bad interesting information. Interesting history, important. Fascinating history. history, great diplomatic history, but history. There was nothing operational no. in it, okay? There was nothing at the time it was published in 1971 that would have helped the North Vietnamese one bit. No, and by the way, some Ellsberg held back four so-called diplomatic volumes at the time, which today would would easily have been right. published. Nobody would have thought Nobody of it. Nobody So then. my argument is, if we publish the Pentagon Papers equivalent today, the secret history of how we escalated in Iraq, the secret history of what we failed to do in Syria, the secret history of what we did or didn't do as North Korea gained nuclear weapons, I don't think anybody would blink. They certainly wouldn't bother to go to court. I can't imagine we'd go to the Supreme Court. So the conversation, the national security conversation, has actually moved to what happens when you're writing about operations that may be underway now or may still give an opportunity for another country to go react. 
Now, there have been moments where we have sort of geared up wondering if the U.S. government was going to go relitigate the Pentagon Papers case. And uh, find a new opportunity to change the law. In other that's words. Right. right. So I published in 2012 the first accounts of Olympic Games, which was the... Um, that's the code word was for... A code name for the American attacks on Iran's nuclear uh, program. Right. It was the first sophisticated <coughs> cyber attack by the United States on another country that we know about. And then in uh, March of 2017, uh, my colleague Bill Broad and I published about a similar attack that was mounted over four years against North Korea's missile program. Now, in neither of those cases did the United States government attempt to go to court and try to stop the Times from publication. We did sit down with them at various moments and say, look, if there are specific details in here... Right, so you negotiated, <coughs> excuse me, you negotiated with the government in a sense and said if there are things you think we should hold back, let us know. Let us know. Now, we always say in that case, decisions ours, it's not yours. I understand. First but I think a lot clear. of people in the public are not aware no, of that. No, they're, they're not aware of that whole process. And, and uh, I certainly made sure that uh, I asked the question, what of this is damaging? Now, I would say to them, particularly in the case of Olympic Games, where the United States made a technical, or Israel made a technological error, and the actual computer code got out onto the internet. Well, I said, look, this is already out because somebody screwed up. So you've got to prove to me that the damage I'm doing here is something that's beyond what the Iranians, the Russians, the Chinese already know. They have the code. Right? And they right. didn't have very much of a case to make beyond that. They had a couple of techniques they asked me to hold back for getting code into computer and you systems. you did hold those back. And I did hold them back. And what happened? Snowden came along and blew those techniques in his revelations. In, so, so you didn't need to... Uh, well, I had held it back, and it was a year later that Snowden right, happened. Right. Uh, and I'm not sure how many people associated the techniques he was describing with what was used in Iran, but sure. in any case, he revealed sure. the techniques. Well, we all know that the Pentagon Papers case, the, the uh, Nixon administration's reasons for going against the New York Times and the Washington Post were as much political and, and strategic in a, in a not a military or, or foreign policy way, but much more had to do with politics. Today, that could be the same. It could be. Um, and, you know, I think you see it a lot in the president's tweets about the failing New York Times, the fake news, CNN, right. and so forth. And perhaps, we don't know yet, in the government's opposition to CNN's parent company being acquired by right, AT&T. Right. Don't know how that's going to shake out. We don't know how that's going to shake out, but there is a hint, a suggestion about it, that, that, that the government's opposition may have more to do with the president's stated views about CNN yes. and his stated views during the campaign that CNN should not be allowed to be purchased here. It would be pretty troubling if that were, if, if this kind of policy were made on the basis of personal resentments, personal feelings about one particular news outlet. That's right, and I think that's one of the interesting things that may come up if this case ever ends up going to court, and we don't know, and frequently antitrust cases get settled. Sure. But one thing that would certainly be fair game would be for, um, AT&T and others to try to subpoena internal documents that would indicate whether or not there was a political motive here right. or whether it was just a pure antitrust concern, which would be perfectly legitimate. You could just, we could argue about whether it's right or wrong, but that's what the Justice Department does in the right. antitrust division. And that gets to this issue. But what it really gets to is the issue of whether or not there is a concerted effort to make sure that news organizations go into hands owners who might be friendlier to the U.S. government. And that's a big concern. Or friendlier to particular factions, particular political, political You know, interests. Sandy, in an odd way, it takes us back to a previous era in American history. If you go back to Jefferson and Adams and all that, you had newspapers that were affiliated of with course. individual parties that's or right. factions within the parties. And I think we are all in agreement that was a pretty ugly moment in American journalism, and we want to never see it again. Well, uh, Trump 
and uh, Steve Bannon, while he was still in the White House, said that the media are the opposition these days. Um, but the remarkable thing is we have to admit the fact that that argument has worked pretty well. I mean, it has you know, worked well. the media polls, you know, slightly lower than Congress and lawyers, okay? Right. So um, that's well, pretty bad. But, it, but there's also <laughs> the argument that the media have to be the opposition at a moment like this because there doesn't appear to be much political opposition that's working. Well, it could if be. If we're going to have a real democracy, a I real would, consideration of different points of view. I would push back at the phrase opposition. I mean, what I often... Not opposition party. That, that's right. But the media has got to maintain its traditional view that it is a skeptical check on whoever the party in power is. And what I worry about is, and I get a lot of email along these lines, is people saying, you know, the New York Times should become part of the resistance, right? Well, resistance is a very loaded word. It is a very loaded word. And I say, no, 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 that's not our role. We're not here to be part of the resistance. Right. We're here to do what the founders had, us, had in mind for us to do. But if you look back at Vietnam, David, uh, the, there was no effective opposition in Congress to the Vietnam War. Appropriations were passed by, with 90 or 95, 98 votes in their favor. There was nobody resisting policy in the opposition party. Under Johnson, the Republicans weren't doing so. Under Nixon, the Democrats were not That's doing right. so. That's right. And if you listen to the Johnson tapes, all of which have now been declassified, right. broadcast, and whatever. Sound pretty tame now, actually, despite his salty language. Yes. Well, it's all a matter of comparison, right? right? Uh, and thank God no one had invented Twitter in the Johnson era. Um, <laughs> I but, imagine, because he never slept. We know that. That's right. Now, you have a <coughs> lot of 2 a.m. tweets. Um, if you listen to those, I keep thinking at various moments, God, what a great news story that would sure. have been had it been broken at the time. At the time. And it might well have changed the course of the Vietnam War at moments at which Johnson was publicly declaring we're winning and privately admitting we're losing. Right, as was Robert McNamara. As, right. And where did we see that happen again? In the Iraq War, where we had right. public descriptions of winning. And when I asked President Bush about this at one point, when I was White House correspondent at the time, he said, I could never get out and declare we were losing. It would demoralize the troops who were bravely well, putting. Of right. And that's fine. I fully understand it. But it makes the exact argument about why an independent media has to get out and be reporting on the Absolutely. most sensitive national security issues at the time in a completely unfettered way. So here's the question. In a context of a free speech project like ours, trying to understand the condition of the First Amendment in the United States today, are the media going to be able to sustain this free posture, this ability to do their job without constant interference and without constantly being accused of being the fake news that actually comes from the other side? Right. We will be constantly being accused of being the fake news because the phrase fake news, which two Catches years on. ago, if we were sitting here, would have been to describe, you know, RT making stuff up has become appropriated by the president to describe news stories he does not like. To describe the traditional mediated form of American journalism where stories are reported, they're processed by editors, people are very careful. That's what's now called fake news by the president. That's right. And if you go back over just the Russia investigation, uh, an investigation started with last February the White House saying no one in the campaign or the transition or the young presidency had been in contact with the Russians. And what we now know, thanks to reporting in the New York Times and the Washington Post and CNN and the New Yorker and many other uh, outlets I'm forgetting along the way here. Um, my big concern is that over the long term there is a real effort by the Justice Department to find ways to crack down on that. And we had one hint of this from Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, who earlier this year said, we That's may right. have to go reconsider the issue of whether or not we subpoena reporters for their sources, not just go after the sources right. themselves. And that is clearly an effort at intimidation on these, on these issues. And, and so we have to worry. We do. Now, we so have not seen 
action by the Trump administration to go do this. We did see it in the Trump admin, in, in the Obama administration. And you know, President it's Obama's true, supporters actually. do yeah. not like to hear it. No, it's true. But th they prosecuted more leak cases than any all the other presidents put all together. All the other presidents combined. And believe me, when I say that in university forums no. or in places where President Obama had a lot of support, there's like a long silence. And I would argue that President Obama created a set of precedents that is, is or will enable the Trump administration to push that even further. That's something we have to be on the, on the guard against, right? That's right. I mean, how, so how do we do it? How do we make sure that the media continue to be able to function? Yes. So the first really? thing you do is you don't think to yourself, I'm not going to push the envelope. You think, I'm going to go out there and do the hardest hitting, fair reporting I can go do, and I'm not going to pull back. That's easier if you're sitting in the newsroom of the New York Times or the Post or some other large news organization that's got a big group of lawyers upstairs. Sure. And what most people don't know. And a lot of resources. And a lot of resources to go finance it and are not going to be easily intimidated. And I don't think people understand the degree to which we frequently bring lawyers into big investigative pieces early on. Right. To say, how can we design this piece to make it more and more um, uh, insulated against government pressure? Let me give you an example. When uh, Bill Broad and I wrote about the American efforts to sabotage the North Korean missiles, we went out of our way to find a lot of unclassified, publicly available but hard to find documentation of sure. this program, much of which we found on the websites of military contractors. Often it's out there, right. It's out there. And of course, we would download it because we knew that 20 minutes after we called the company and asked them about it, it would disappear from their website. And it <laughs> did. Okay. And we wrote a story that went along with it. Took that some said, screenshots first, right? Yes, a lot of them. And uh, we wrote a story that said, uh, a secret program hidden in plain sight and, and describe that. And part of that is to explain that you can do a lot of this with unclassified material. Yeah. But part of that is to say to the U.S. government, hey, before you go prosecute this, you might want to go back and look what's right. in the public record. Well, and, and actually one of the lessons of all this over time is that the government is very weak at keeping its secrets. That's right. And it classifies so, too much so that things are bound to leak out and then is not very good at keeping the really things it regards as important secret. And that gets to what's a separate issue for a separate series for you, but you know, if I was king for a day, I would get the US government to design a classification system that has a tiny fraction of what is today classified, right. right? And takes most of what today is classified, have it declassified in six months for a year or something like that and then really work on protecting the secrets they really need to protect. David, that's, that is so uh, sensible. So many people have said it, and the government just doesn't seem to be able to reduce the amount of classified information. And the reason for that is nobody ever got fired for overclassifying. That's right. And lots that's right. of people have gotten fired for not classifying for something not. that later on turned out to be important. I have been, I, I was for a time a member of something called the uh, Public Interest Declassification Board, and I've been at briefings and talking about this whole issue. And just the fear on the faces of people in key jobs at the idea that they might be, any of these people might be the one who makes a mistake and doesn't classify something that then gets out. That's what motivates them. Absolutely. The I was out giving a talk at one of the service academies a year or so ago and sat down at lunch with a group of young people, all of whom had been given you know, low to medium level security clearances right. and had to go make these decisions each and every day. And every one of them said to me, we just classify everything sure. because you're not going to get in trouble for that. And you can do it with one key right. that says this is for legal reason right. number so and so that they haven't even right. read. And then the pipeline gets clogged and it leaks. It and bursts. It, it leaks. And then the first thing that you hear is, oh my goodness, you published classified information. That's right. That's right. Not should this information have been classified to begin with. Last quick question for you, David. 
Are you doing your work any differently now? I know there are all these electronic digital changes in the way journalists do their work, but politically speaking, the, cha the political changes in this country, are you doing your work differently than you were, say, two years ago? You know, uh, technologically, we're doing a few things. Sure. So we're communicating with people over encrypted lines more. We keep almost nothing sensitive in the computer system. On the, but your question really goes to how do you go about the the day to day, right? Uh, right, and what it is is you now recognize that the stakes are dramatically higher, and I think something that we've in the media have found gratifying for the past year is you have sort of the equivalent line occasionally being given to us more than occasionally to that line that I always graded on me a little bit because I thought it, it, it denigrated people's deep service. When people would stop people in sudden uniform and say thank you for your service, it was a little bit too easy, right? But we're actually having people come by and doing protests in front of the New York Times building in favor of what we're doing, okay? I've never seen that before in 35 years. Make sure you get years. pictures of those. Yeah, too. right, I'm sure it'll disappear quickly. And people who stop and say, you know, I never really right. thought of what journalism, what's happening in journalism as an essential element of public service. Yeah, I, I heard that part in civics about the First Amendment, but never felt it right. until this past year. And are you ever doing the old image of the investigative reporter, I mean, like Bob Woodward meeting Mark Felt in the parking garage? Are you, are you so, having documents handed over to you in dark parks at night? So I have a confession to make, Sandy. 35 years in the business, never a single document handed to me in a parking lot except for a parking ticket. Okay. <laughs> now, um, however, um, that's not how this is done anymore. No. I mean, we're in such a digital world right. that when leaks happen, they happen in mass. Sure. The Snowden leaks were, what did we get, 250,000 cables? The question wasn't, what do we think of these? It's how do we sort through them? Right, and, and in what period of time? Yeah, and that is, that's what's happened, uh, I'm sorry, that was the WikiLeaks cables that were the 250,000 right. uh, State Department cables. And Snowden had you know large amounts of documents, so that got doled out much more slowly. Um, so these things happen in mass now. Totally different format of trying to convince the pub, trying to tell the public about its own business. That's right. And whenever you get 250,000 of anything, <laughs> you can guess that 249,000 of them are useless. fundamentally going to be useless. Right. And it's the question of finding the telling important gem in the midst of that giant pile. Right. Thank you, David. Thank you, Sandy. We've been discussing First Amendment issues surrounding the news coverage of national security with David Sanger from the New York Times. To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.